you're sitting at the table, mechanically going through the motions of eating. It's meatloaf night. The frosty atmosphere seems to have turned your food cold, so you push it around the plate like a child does with vegetables. Your wife doesn't eat anything, and you can't remember the last time she did. You've lost track of time recently. Thankfully, your in-laws, who stayed for a couple of days earlier this week, have left, taking the hardly worn baby grows with them. They were too distressing for your wife, they said. It's 8.29 now. You're looking at the second hand heavily ticking past the minute hand. At exactly 8.30, you stand up and grab your keys. Where are you going? Out. Will you be home soon? Maybe. Okay. Her eyes well up and she starts to cry. <laughs> Gently at first, then uncontrollably. Her whole frame rocking with inconsistent breathing patterns. <laughs> you hold her gently. She begs you not to go. Not tonight. While she accuses you of gambling, drinking, cheating. You're being crazy. You tell her she's crazy. She's confused. And should get some rest. You'll be home soon. I love you. Then you're in the car, like a kid at Christmas, excited. Now you're back, sitting at the familiar table. James and Nick on your left. On your right you have a new player, Simon you think you remember someone say and next to him Hugh the dealer dead ahead of you Christoph Bergman's eyes burn into the back of your cards you subconsciously pull them a little closer to yourself no one here is friends you know the names of the people gathered around you but don't owe anyone anything other than your time and money on the table when you leave at the end of the night you'll become strangers again. The stakes are pretty high. In the centre of the table is an assortment of coloured chips, which you've added up to be enough to buy your wife the new kitchen she mentioned. You toyed with the idea of folding, bluffed through the next deal and took a chance. You tried to get Bergman to fold, but Bergman never folds. Everyone else has given up the game. James tries to catch your eye, but you don't respond. Bergman can't help a smirk as he turns his cards over and reveals two tens. Four of a kind. He sits back, arms folded, an almost menacing grin spreading across his face. Everyone expected it. No one expected you to win this one. No one even expected you to come tonight because they'd heard from around town what happened a few weeks ago. Painfully slowly, you turn your cards over. The Ace of Diamonds. You sneak a glance at Bergman, whose face has blanched and his grin has gone. the Queen of Diamonds. You exhale, your heart pounding in your chest. Royal flush. Bergman excuses himself. You pull your winnings towards you, the stacks of chips toppling down over your hands. You allow a smile for yourself. 
in the back of your mind you see your wife's face and I'm begging you not to go and the winnings become a hollow victory you get home late the porch light is on but the rest of the house is engulfed in darkness your wife must be in bed The kettle boils and you rub your leaden eyes, heavy with smoke and fatigue. You make yourself a strong coffee. There is death in the house. Lost in your reverie, your coffee has gone cold. So you put the kettle on again, make another, hoping the caffeine will keep you awake as long as possible. Reaching into the drawer, you find the single cigarette you left there. Why is there an elastic band in the fruit bowl? What? Never mind. Is that a lighter? Yeah, I put it in there earlier. It's good for lighting candles. You know, when we get the new kitchen, we can have a drawer for all this crap. Don't really think this is what the fruit bowl was intended for. We can't afford a new kitchen. Yeah, well. Not right now, but in a couple of months. I don't want anything paid for with gambling money. It feels dirty. You've never had a problem before? When the baby comes, I want this house to be perfect. No gambling, no smoking, nothing. No dirty money. It's not dirty. Please. swear for a split second you can feel a warm tingle on your lips as if she's just kissed them again. Grabbing the lighter, you head to the back door. You unlock it, turning the key deathly slowly try to avoid the creaking that will echo in the hollow rooms. You flick the lighter, but wait a moment before lighting up the cigarette. You feel like a rebellious kid again, and it reminds you of the time you bunked off school with your friends and raided your dad's drink cabinet. Excited. You light up, and hold the cigarette delicately between your fingers, afraid that you could snap it with your heavy-handedness that seems to bulldoze over everything lately. You allow the bittersweet smokiness to fill your mouth and linger on your tongue like a romantic embrace. You'd forgotten what it's like. A chill runs across your skin and reminds you that you're not wearing a jacket. It's cold out here on your own. You go back inside and lock the door. It's not time to go upstairs yet. Putting the lighter back in the bowl, you begin to shuffle through the other lost items that have found refuge there. A couple of pencils, receipts, an elastic band, a button.
you see a travel bag in the corner. You walk over to it and lift it up. It's packed. Maybe your wife is going to a spa for the weekend. Perhaps they're old clothes she's taking to the charity shop. You'll ask her in the morning. No, you'll ask her now. You'll ask her in the morning. You think of the baby. A lurch in your stomach forces you to think of something else. Your wife. You should go to bed. You go upstairs and push the door ajar. You squeeze yourself through, not wanting to let too much light in from the landing. Your wife is in bed, pretending to be asleep. You play along, not wanting to talk yet. You lie down next to her. You want to sleep but hate dreaming, hate pretending to sleep, like your wife does. You long to hold her hand under the duvet but are scared that she'll pull it away and even more scared that she won't respond at all. Time passes. Both of you lie in the fetal position, back to back, staring at the walls. No words. Not even the sound of breathing. In the silence, your conscience takes over and gnaws at your nerves. I wish you hadn't gone tonight. You think desperately for something to say, but her voice cuts through the silence again. I'm going to my parents' house in the morning. She waits. The silence eats away at the remnants of your relationship. Will you be home for dinner? Don't know when I'll be back. Your heart is pounding in your chest and you feel sick, like someone just punched you in your diaphragm. Inside, you're screaming, tell her not to leave, knowing if she walks out the front door, she may never come back. You love her. Now it's your turn to beg her to stay, but you can't quite say it out loud. You know you've bet your wife away. 